right. So I'm going to flip over to uh, my terminal, and I'm going to show you <coughs> uh, the Docker demo, the Docker Compose demo app, which is um, a bunch of files. Um, I'm going to walk through them very briefly. So firstly, we've got this is what our app actually is. It's a Python application. Um, we're using Flask and Redis. Um, and we're going to connect to a Redis host. Um, we're being told where it is via this environment variable, incidentally, a Redis host. Um, and every time our app is hit, um, we increment a counter and we say, hello world, I've been seen this many times. So basically, every time you hit it, the counter increments. And that demonstrates that we have a Python app that is connected to a Redis server and the, um, you know, the two are talking to each other and we can talk to the Python app on the outside world. So that's a very simple demonstration. Um, we have a very simple Docker file that is going to just put our Python app into a container, I'm literally just going to grab the Python image off the Docker Hub. We're going to put the code inside. We're going to pip install uh, Flask and Redis, basically. Uh, and that's it. Uh, so this is all just plain Docker so far. Um, then we have a Docker Compose YAML, and this is what um, this is what Compose is all about. So it gets we get to define two services, one called Web and one called Redis. So the Web one is the interesting one. Firstly, we say that we build the image for this uh, web service using the code in the current directory and the Docker file in the current directory. We set the command to Python app.py, which will run the Python file that I just showed you. We are exposing port 5000 in the container to port 5000 on the host machine. We are linking our web uh, container to the Redis container, um, and that will um, that will create a uh, host name uh, accessible from the web container called Redis. And in the environment here, uh, we're setting... Um, we're setting the Redis host to that host name. So it will uh, connect directly to the locally defined Redis container. We're also setting the Python, Python on buffered environment variable just so that we don't get any buffering of log output or anything like that. Finally, we're mounting the code in the current directory inside the container at runtime. So we're saying the code in the current directory is going to be mapped to slash code inside the container, which will overwrite the code that's inside the Docker image. The purpose of that is so that we can edit our code and it will update live in real time. So so far, this is all um, this is all stuff that Compose has been able to do for ages. I'm going to demonstrate it anyway, just so that we're all absolutely on the same page. So if I type Compose up, then it will create both of those containers. What you didn't see it do is pull the Redis image and build the web image. We're skipping that stage just because it's not really relevant at this point. But we've created um, two containers, and you can see there that they're both running. Redis server is uh, running here, the web server is running here, and it's got port uh, 5000 exposed, which means that if I uh, tell it, then um, I'm using, so my, I'm running Docker inside a virtual machine, and so I'm using Docker machine to actually provision that, and that means that to get the IP of my VM, I can just type Docker Machine IP Dev. That's the name of my uh, Dev machine. So if I curl it, we see that it says Hello World. I've been seen one times, and then if I repeatedly curl it, it will increment the counter. So that shows us that Web is connected to Redis, and Redis is incrementing its counter. So everything's working just fine. So that's great. Um, that is like the basic, normal, like composed demo that um, that you've probably seen before. Um, what we're going to do now is imagine that we want to deploy this application to a production environment where our requirements are somewhat different. So you might have noticed when I LS before that we also have a production.yaml. Um, and that is another Docker Compose YAML, essentially, but with a few things uh, a few things different. So um, uh, for one thing, we don't have a Redis service in here because we're imagining that in production, uh, our persistence uh, layer is perhaps managed by another team or it's just managed separately using another tool or something like that. Maybe it's done manually. Maybe yeah, maybe there's a DBA or something like that. In any case, the uh, person or people responsible for managing 
the Redis host have given us an IP address to connect to. So we're just going to stick that in into the environment variable. Um, so um, other than that, uh, it shares a lot in common with the last uh, Docker Compose YAML. In fact, we can put them up side by side. Um, and you can see that there's a lot of repetition between these two things. But, um, but yeah, the main differences are in the production.yaml, there's no Redis container because Redis is external. Uh, we're setting an external IP for the Redis host. And finally, the, that volumes entry we had down here is not present. And that's because in production, we don't want live reloading. It's like, um, it's not even like clear if that makes any sense because your production machine is not going to be a remote machine. So whereas here I can come into uh, app.py and be like, hello, Docker, online, meet up. And then run that curl command again. You'll see how the text has changed and the counter continues to increment that because our jet, um container has got the code mounted inside as a volume. Now, um, now we can change it back, obviously. So, like, in production, we obviously don't want that. In production, you want your code to, like, you know, to not change once you've deployed it, because that's kind of the point of why we go to all this trouble with uh, Docker images and build artifacts and stuff like that. Um, so, um, we've got a production.yaml, and we can very easily deploy that. I'm just going to do that in this uh, terminal down here. Um, so, I've... Using Docker Machine, I've already prepared a DigitalOcean box, which I'm just going to um, I'm going to use Docker Machine to get my environment set up to point at it, and then I'm just going to say Docker Compose up to SD. Oh, whoops! So I made a mistake there. Um, all right. Pay no attention to that. So what I actually wanted to do was say docker compose and then dash f production.yaml because I want to say use this different production.yaml, uh, use this different compose yaml file, don't use, um, don't use the like default one. So you can see when I run that, it only creates a web, it doesn't create a web. And then if I, if I docker compose ps, we only have a web container. And finally if I if I inspect that container and just grep out the Redis host environment variable, we should see, yeah, it's set to the right thing. So everything everything is fine, and we've uh, we've deployed our app to production. We can um, we can curl it. If I say if I ask for the IP of my production machine instead, you can see that it's running. You can see how the counter is uh, uh, is like already been already been incremented a few times because you know the, the Redis instance is a long running instance. Um, and so it's you know we've got like production data like already there and that's like you know another thing that you uh, um, that you experience when uh, deploying to production is you know someone else is managing the data for you. The demonstration of that and that I'm willing. Um, so uh, so we've got everything we've got everything deployed to production. Um, we can just like absolutely confirm that if I go and change app.py again, that uh, if I uh, if we call production machine, it hasn't updated because obviously we're not mounting uh, we're not mounting the code uh, in a volume. It's just staying there in the image um, and it's immutable. So. Um, so this is all great, except that, like I said, there's quite a lot of duplication between what's between um, the development and production YAML files. Like um, quite a lot is repeated. We've got the build is repeated, we've got command repeated, we've got ports repeated, and we've got this environment variable repeated. So what I'm going to show is how we can use the extends feature to factor out a lot of that duplication and um, keep everything clean so that we don't get bugs from like things drifting apart and so that we don't ha have the tedium of uh, maintaining the same thing in two places at once. So what I'm going to do is just take this stuff 
and uh, put it in a common DOM YAML. I'm going to remove that because that's not specific. That's not uh, generic, sorry. But everything in here is uh, common to both environments. So I'm just going to save that. So now we have a common .yaml with a web service defined in it. I'm going to change our development file to remove all of the common stuff. Oops. Um, leaving just what is specific to development, then say, use extends to say, there is a file called common.yaml. There is a service in it called web. And that's basically it. So what we've done now, if I, what we've done now is uh, we've said that we want to fetch all the configuration from here from uh, web, the web service in common.yaml, and basically treat it as if we'd, we'd typed it up here. Then uh, everything we, everything else we put under web will sort of augment or replace variables as, um, as necessary. So we're adding a link scheme. Uh, we're adding to the environment. So rather than replacing the whole environment wholesale, we're actually um, we're taking the Python and buffered variable, um, preserving that, and also adding the Redis host variable. And finally, we're adding the volume entry. Then we're saying we've also got this other um, service here, which um, which is specific to this uh, environment called Redis, um, and that's just using the Redis image of the hub. So I'm then going to update the production YAML to uh, also factor out the duplication. So here. Uh, that goes, all of these go, and I just say service work. So um, at that point, we've reduced all of the duplication to, um, we've removed it all, put it in the common dot YAML. Uh, we now have three files that do exactly the same as our two files did before, but now there's no repetition. So if I, over here in development world, if I type doc and both up, I'll just work. Yep, so we've still got a Redis and a web. Um, it's still uh, listening and on all the same stuff, and if I curl the dev machine, we're still going. Brilliant. Down here, if I use the production.yaml to deploy, we've still got just a web. You can confirm that with PS. And if I curl the production machine, you can see that it's still going. Finally, if I make an edit one more time, and run curl again against dev. We see the changes made. If I run the same curl against prod, we see it hasn't. So there we go. We've got exactly the same behavior as before, but now we've got it in um, three files instead of two. So we've got an extra file, but we have factored out all of the duplication from before. And um, yeah, um, so this, uh, this is like a really, really simple example, obviously. Um, it's kind of contrived because it's not like a serious app that does anything useful. But um, I hope that this demonstrates that um, extends can be really good for reducing duplication between files. Um, what I haven't really shown is that it can also be useful for reducing duplication across apps. So using exactly the same principle, um, we might have rather than a kind of local common dot yaml um, we might have across multiple different apps defined with compose we might have a, um, a, a file or a series of files containing uh, commonly used service definitions um, that you'd maybe check out in another git repository or in a sub module or something and then from your um, 
from the app that you're working on now, you can include those into your local configuration. So that is uh, a very quick overview of Extends, and uh, I'm now going to switch back and um, take some questions if my computer will work, which it won't. There we go. So, um, wow, that was quicker than I expected it to be. So, um, can the environment settings per service be extended as well? Um, in the dynamic, we're writing out environment configuration files by state of app and per staging dev. Um, so, basically, you can extend, like, uh, like I uh, showed with the, um, uh, the two environment variables, um, you can, whenever you extend and like add environment variables, those are sort of, um, those are all like added to the same list. Uh, if you mention an environment variable again, it will essentially reset it. So there's a kind of like dictionary merge style thing going on there. Um, so you can totally, um, you can totally, uh, in extend uh, any bit, any piece of like uh, compose configuration. Um, in most cases, you know, when you've got when it's just a single value, the new value will replace the uh, value in the service that you are extending from. Um, in cases of multiple values, they'll either sit by side by side, or um, uh, in the case of environment variables, then um, new ones will like overwrite old ones. Um, how is it different from Ansible YAML? Um, I don't actually know. Um, so I uh, haven't used Ansible a huge amount, but um, I imagine the two probably share quite a lot in common. Um, it's always something I've been meaning to investigate more. Um, YAML for Compose, is the format space sensitive? Uh, yes, it is, at, at, at least in the sense that indentation is significant. White space in general is not significant. It doesn't matter if I, um, if I type image colon uh, I can put any number of spaces before I say what the name of my image is, for example, but um, indentation, much like with the Python language, um, is significant, yes. Uh, is there any concept of using variable syntax within the YAML file? Um, that, so, uh, yes, but your example, um, your, your specific example, no. So basically, uh, we want to uh, introduce the ability to interpolate variables using more or less the exact syntax you've described there with dollars and curly brackets. Um, and my thinking is that we should definitely do that for all kind of normal configuration values, values for um, values for the image, values for ports, values for commands, values for um, environment variables, and all of that stuff. That, that's absolutely fine. I'm less sure about um, including a, like, uh, in expanding environment variables within the path name of another compose file, because that sounds to me like a, like an anti-pattern in the first place. Like, that would make me, that would, that would make me a bit nervous if I was including a file at runtime and the actual file I was including, uh, was not actually known until runtime, because that reminds me of, well, I mean, it reminds me of the kind of, like, uh, import trickery that people used to do in the Ruby language that led to um, horribly unmaintainable apps. So we probably won't allow it for that, but for most other uh, bits of configuration, we definitely want to introduce the, uh, the ability to expand environment variables. Um, does extend support URLs instead of just files? Not right now, but that's a really like good idea. We want to probably it would be really good to support like HTTP URL um, to a compose file. It also might be really good to support a Git URL so that you could um, so you could specify the URL to another Git repository, um, and that's um, uh, that like that would open up all kinds of possibilities. Link section in the compose.yaml could be linked to a container already created. There is a separate uh, configuration key for that called external underscore links that does exactly what you're describing. So if you have a container that's already running with a particular name, you can put it under external links, you can give it an alias, and um, it'll work just fine. So that's 
um, that would be another like an alternate way to um, to have uh, to like link in the Redis service. If you were going to production and you knew that there was a Redis container already running, then you could stick your Redis container under uh, external links, for example. Can the common file have more than one service in it? it absolutely, yes. Uh, you can have as many as you like, and you can uh, you just reference it by name. So when you uh, use your extends key, you um, you will um, say you give the, both the file name and the service name in the other file. Um, how many levels of nesting does extend support? Uh, the uh, arbitrary arbitrarily many. Um, it uh, I mean it's probably not a good idea to go like more than more than like two or three levels deep just from an application architecture standpoint, I start being a bit worried about what's going on there. But um, Compose is not going to stop you. The only thing it's going to stop you from doing is circular references. Um, so we detect those, and our Compose will just review to run with those circular references. Um, I saw that in the dev environment, you share the volume, but in the production, not. how would you update the code base in this case? Uh, good point. I should have said that. So basically, the idea is that in production, you like you only want to update the code by actually deploying. So in production, the idea would be you'd uh, rebuild the image, you'd type Docker Compose build, um, then you would post that image somewhere. Then on your production, like when uh, working against your production machine, you'd pull the new version of the image, and then you would um, uh, then you would run the uh, Docker Compose up again. Um, Using Docker Compose is better than build a Docker file. Um, uh, the two, the two complement each other perfectly. Like uh, in that demo, I was using a Docker file. Um, there was like uh, there was a Docker build step that I that I kind of skipped. Um, but um, and then then Docker Compose like runs that image. So they it's not a matter of all. Um, using Compose works very well with Docker files, and that we designed it to work that way. Um, when will Docker Compose be ready for production? Good question. Uh, not yet. Um, there's, there's frankly a lot to do. Um, stuff like this is really important for making it possible to. <coughs> excuse me. For making it possible to, um, you know, run the same app in multiple environments without a lot of tedium. Um, there's a lot more than he's doing. We need good answers to networking. We need good answers to load balancing. We need good answers to deployment and rollback and stuff like that. Um, we there's yeah there, there's an awful lot to do. There's a, a document on um, there's a document on the uh, uh, compose website. Um, I'm going to type that in now. Um, this is from memory, but so it might be wrong, but. Um, uh, but uh, dot stop docker dot com slash compose slash production. I just I just put it in chat. Um, so uh, that is kind of an ongoing document about like what you need to think about when if you really want to use compose in production. But like right now at the top of it, we say we don't recommend it, and that warning will continue to be true uh, while we you know improve. Um, while we improve composer support. But like it's getting better release on release. <clears throat> How can I solve circular links between two containers? Um, basically, uh, very soon Docker is going to come out with um, an entirely new type of uh, an entirely new model for networking. Um, it, rather than links, you will be able to create named networks and containers can join and leave those networks. Then if two containers are in the same network, uh, they can see each other, they can talk to each other, they can access one another by a particular host name. And that is going to solve that circular links problem. Um, so the answer is, like, uh, in fact, like the answer will eventually be don't use links if you have circular dependencies. Is there runtime metadata available for infra introspection to figure out which YAML was used to deploy the apps? That's a really good idea. Um, there, there will be eventually, actually. So one thing we're adding is um, in the next release, we're going to be adding um, uh, labels. Now that Docker supports like key value label metadata, we're going to um, 
uh, we're going to be able to, to use that to keep track of containers. And the thing we're probably going to do down the line from that is uh, add all kinds of other useful metadata, such as what, like the file name of the YAML file that was used to deploy that container. Of course, if you're like that doesn't get you, like you, you still have um, the thing of like, well, maybe uh, I deployed the container to the remote server and this was the path on my machine, but that's not very useful to my coworker over here. Um, so we might do, we might like do something clever there where we like stick in a hash of the file or maybe like a, um, uh, maybe we could like uh, do something cool with like a like git commit and like file blob ID or something like that. But like, I don't know, there's all kinds of stuff you can do there, most of which is probably not going to be Composer's job, but um, there, should, there should at least be a way to sort of hook in and add metadata like that. Um, is there any complex example? Um, there, I, I, I don't have one to hand, um, but there's, um, uh, I've seen a few in IRC and on GitHub before. Um, I'm afraid I don't have one to hand right now, but so. Um, do you run the compose commands in uh, Dockerhost or localhost? Oh yeah, that, that was all on my local machine. So I was uh, I was running those on my local machine, and I was using Docker machine to point my uh, environment variables at one Docker host or the other. So yeah, the um, the, the uh, hidden like style of that show was was machine, which um, which uh, makes it really easy to both create and uh, destroy and manage a bunch of different Docker hosts, whether they're local VMs or remote servers. In, in our case, we had one of each. We had a virtual box VM locally and a digital ocean server remotely, but also makes it really easy to um, uh, to uh, point your like Docker client or Docker compose at uh, one or the other. Um, is there any integration between Docker Compose and Windows Azure or any cloud service provider? Yes, um, basically the integration is the Docker API. So, uh, for example, with Windows Azure, there, uh, there is a driver for Windows Azure in Docker Machine. That means that you can use Docker Machine if you have an Azure account. Um, you can use Docker Machine to create uh, an Azure instance that is running the Docker daemon. And at that point, you just need to um, run the Docker machine command, the Docker machine env command, to point your environment at that um, uh, at that cloud server, and then Docker Compose will just work because that's how um, uh, because it uses the same environment variables as the Docker client. It uses the same API as the Docker client. So if uh, if you can use Docker against uh, a local uh, cloud uh, a remote cloud provider, then you can use Docker Compose with it. Is there a planned release date for the next version of Compose that includes the recently merged log driver support? Um, there is not a release date, but it is uh, it's happening soon. Um, it basically uh, Compose is now released in lockstep with uh, Docker. So uh, as far as we um, as far as we like can possibly manage, we release Compose on the same day as we release the Docker engine. So. When Docker Engine 1.7 comes out, that is when we hope to release Docker Compose 1.3. Um, lost my place. Um, how to compose Docker using image cross machine? Um, I, if what you mean is um, like how to how to how to use the same image uh, with those across multiple machines. The answer is uh, the, the answer is basically that you um, you should use um, Docker push and Docker pull as in the standard Docker binary uh, push and pull commands to um, to get the image on like uh, like if you've got the image like the image uh, in the right like in the right state in one machine. You should use Docker pull um, to get it to a registry somewhere, whether that's Docker Hub or a private one of your own. Um, you should then Docker pull it on the other machine to make sure it's up to date there. Then you can point compose at that other machine and run it. Um, there's like it's a bit of a manual process right now, but um, I think 
I think it's something that we could add, that we should at least look at sort of, um, at, at sort of supporting a kind of simple, um, simple-ish workflow there. But right now it's like, it's, it's maybe four Docker commands, it's not too bad. Um, following on from my nesting question, playing devil's advocate. So, limit to the number of extends in the same host section, presumably. Uh, so, you can only put an extends key once in a sync under a single service. So, like, I can't say my web service extends this other web service, and also this other web service, and also this other web service. Um, that I can sort of I can sort of see some use cases for that. They'd basically be behaving like mix-ins at that point rather than rather than inheritance if we are to make an analogy to programming and classes. But um but I think that's I think that's something that like we would add if there was a compelling number of people asking for it. But like right now um right right now people seem pretty happy with just the uh, just the one double. How do you make Compose deploy on DigitalOcean? Can you explain it again? Yeah, um, why don't I just do that again? So um, basically, uh, if I'll share my desktop again. Hang on. So um, over here, let's just move this one. Uh, over here, um, I've got two machines. Uh, dev and prod. So dev is a virtual box and prod is a digital ocean. So all of this stuff is, um, specific, is, is really a Docker machine, uh, concern. But if you haven't checked that Docker machine, I highly recommend it. So basically, um, I can use Docker machine to create, uh, images. Sorry, not images. Um, uh, Docker instances. Um, and uh, depending on what driver I tell it to use, it will either create it um, using VirtualBox or using some cloud provider. So I could say, for example, I could say, create me another dev machine using the VirtualBox driver, and it would do that. Or I could say, create me a DigitalOcean machine. Now, what I'm not showing you is how I give it my DigitalOcean access token. That's actually sitting in an environment variable. But basically, if I were to, like, um, hit return on this, it would uh, it would go and create me a DigitalOcean droplet from a particular image. It would spin up the Docker daemon on that droplet. It would configure SSL. It would um, set up my local certificates. And then it would tell me how to um, give me a single command to set up my environment um, which is, which goes like that, um, that, uh, that, uh, tells me how to, um, how to point my Docker client at that, uh, at that machine. So from that point on, if I were to do that, which is in fact what I've done down here, so like in this shell, I've literally just copied and pasted that. And then, um, you know, um, Basically, down here, I'm uh, I'm running commands against this solution machine. So, like, um, Docker machine makes that ridiculously simple, and I highly recommend trying it out. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, uh, does Docker Compose support different registries, say, for X from private and Y from public? Um, it absolutely does. You basically just put the full, fully qualified the um, URL of the image, say like myregistry.com slash image name, and then you've, um, then yeah, it will pull that from the private registry. Um, there's unfortunately a bug in Compose right now where um, pulling from private registries um, doesn't always work uh, and uh, results in a, uh, access denied, but um, we've got a fix for that waiting to go out in Docker Compose 1.3. Um, what do you recommend to use in production on single host systems for now? Um, I, I mean, you could give Compose a try, um, but like, don't, don't rely on it. Basically, um, like, uh, I can't in good conscience say that. Um, I, I, I think like, right now I don't think there is a satisfactory solution, which is part of why we're, um, 
where we're, you know, uh, racing ahead with Compose and trying to get it production ready because I don't think that is a good solution. Like, right now, you sort of have to do a lot of stuff yourself. Um, you've got to either do some stuff with shell scripts and Docker commands, or you've got to do some stuff with... Um, well, yeah, that's... I mean, that's... that's uh, or you've got to, like, roll your own production environment, or you've got to, like... Um, set it inside a Puppet or Enhanceable configuration or something like that. It's just, it's kind of a mess. And um, uh, and I, I don't think there's a good answer to it. Uh, versioning of YAML file itself supported, uh, not at the moment, but, but that's mostly because we haven't introduced any backwards incompatible changes yet. Um, I think we would start versioning it uh, at such a time as, like, it started looking like we needed to make breaking changes. Um, but uh, but for now, we haven't needed to do it. We'll also be getting SDN capability, or will it have to rely on another tool like Clocker? Um, it totally will. Um, this is happening as part of Docker's networking effort. Um, basically, networking is going to become... Uh, two things. There'll be a defined abstraction for creating networks and for joining them and leaving them, and then that that can be um, implemented by networking drivers, which will um, implement, like you know, which will provide networking capabilities in various different ways. There'll be an out of the box one that works just like Docker networking does now, or more or less. Then there'll be um, Plugins that you can use to um, to do like overlay networking and all kinds of uh, cool SDN stuff. Um, but yes, that will all be transparent to the um, to the uh, to any like consumer of the Docker API, which will just expect networking to work. And um, if the plugins do their job, then it will. Um, Thoughts on separate deployment inventory from Docker Compose YAML. I'm afraid I'm not sure what that means, um, but if you like, um, yeah, I'm not sure what you mean by deployment inventory. But if you can reword that, then I'll try and answer it again. When will Docker Compose support LXC conf environment variables? I am not sure it will because Docker doesn't necessarily use LXC anymore. The uh, the use of LXC is kind of breaking the uh, abstraction because Docker has multiple different container backends, and in fact the default one, as I understand it, is now live container and not LXC. So I'm not sure LXC conf environment variables would make very much sense from the Compose perspective. Are there any tools or applications you suggest for managing the Docker networks? Topology when it's very complicated. Um, I think that that is probably that. I don't think anything great exists right now that I'm aware of. But I think that once Docker networking is standardized and released, um, there'll probably be a whole um, kind of out, you know, a, a whole spring of, um, of tools for uh, building complex topologies and that kind of thing will uh, will spring up. Are there plans to add lib network support to Docker Compose? Basically, um, that, I mean, yes and no. There's, like, Docker Compose doesn't really have to know about the existence of lib network. Uh, but if lib network results in changes to the Docker API and changes to the conceptual model of networking, which it most likely will, then um, Docker Compose will obviously be updated to incorporate those. So that might involve... Um, there's actually a ticket on GitHub about this if you go and um, search for it. Um, Docker networking on the on the Compose repository. There's a um, there's a uh, page. Uh, there's an issue I started about how to how to do networking from a kind of configuration and user experience perspective. What is the best tool for managing hundreds of containers in a GUI? I I'm I honestly don't know. I've never really played with any of the Docker GUI tools. Um, I have heard of Shityard, but that is basically the extent of my knowledge. Um, for a free container app, UI API DB will not propose to be able to wait for the services to be available before running the dependent one, e.g. making sure the DB is accessible before running the API. Um, we've talked about this a lot on GitHub, and um, I am... Um, pretty strongly of the opinion that Compose should not do any waiting of that kind. The basic reason for that is that, in my opinion, it should be the dependent container's job to do its own polling and retrying and waiting. Um, the reason I believe that is because 
the um, the state of your, your, your database not being available yet is only one circumstance under which your database might not be accessible. So um, the fact that your DB isn't ready yet is basically the same case as like all kinds of other things you're going to see in the real world, such as the network is down, or your database has just had a hiccup, or it's been restarted, or something like that. It's stuff that your container is going to have to deal with anyway, and that Compose can't really reasonably be expected to help with. Um, there's a principle um, I like to follow from that I learned about uh, from the TCP protocol called the end-to-end -end principle, wherein the like the smart bits of logic should be in the ends, not in the middle. Um, Applying that here, I think it's the job of the containers to be smart about retrying and about waiting and about polling and about um, keeping the um, like you know keeping the connection alive or um, re-establishing the connection and that kind of thing. Um, and it should not be the job of any tools in between. Um, so for that reason, I don't want to put that complexity into Compose. I don't want people to start depending on it. Can several containers deployed with the Compose app be deployed on several machines? Yes, um, it's called Docker Swarm. Um, so Compose does not um, uh, does not support like directly pointing at multiple Docker hosts. But if you are using Swarm to uh, to abstract over several Docker hosts uh, and expose a single API endpoint which is Swarm's job, you can point Compose at that Swarm cluster and uh, Swarm will run those containers wherever it thinks is best. Um, so that's the actual like proper way to do it. Obviously, neither Compose nor Swarm are considered production ready yet, but um, it's uh, sort of still in the making. Would you consider using Docker machine versus Docker for environments that have data sensitive development and delay in a cloud environment? I think that um, eventually Docker machine should be the way to provision <coughs> to provision uh, any kind of uh, any kind of server that runs the Docker daemon. I think that um, it's not it's not quite there right now. It has kind of a fixed set of drivers. And one thing that it needs is the ability to um, to uh, sort of incorporate new drivers at runtime, that kind of thing. But um, but I think eventually it will um, it's going to grow to be sort of the the, the recommended way to uh, like provision a new Docker instance of any kind, whether that's development or QA or production or whatever, and whether you're you've got like data centers or whether you've got um, uh, you're using a cloud provider, or whether you've got hardware in the building, or whatever it is. Like, um, eventually, machine should be the thing that abstracts completely over that and just gives you a thing that runs Docker. Um, any new features in the new Docker Compose version other than the extended feature you demonstrated? So, uh, the extended feature came out in Compose 1.2 some time ago. Um, there is plenty of new stuff in Docker Compose 1.3. I suggest going and finding the 1.3 milestone on GitHub. Which has a ton of stuff attached to it. Um, there's, yeah, it's it's uh, it's going to be really cool. Um, I think uh, it's uh, one of the releases I, I'm so far most proud of. Um, is we've worked slash we going to be integrated into Docker? Um, yes, in the sense that um, uh, we uh, will be able to uh, integrate its networking capabilities into Docker via libnetwork and being a libnetwork driver. Um, that's sort of the um, abstraction point. So once libnetwork is um, is uh, implemented and once there is a driver interface, um, the we folks will be able to write a libnetwork plugin that uses uh, their technology to provide Docker networking capabilities. Cool. All right, folks, uh, we have finished a bit early, but I think that's probably fine. Um, I, I hope that was, um, I hope that was helpful and clear and stuff. There was one other thing I was going to say, which is that, um, if you want to get a good overview of 
extends, uh, you can go to this URL, which I'm just going to put in chat, um, doc.docker.com slash compose slash extends. Um, and I am uh, also, uh, also want to tell you about um, net, next week's meetup, uh, where, um, which is going to be all about the Docker registry. Um, so make sure to come along to that. Um, you can check it out on Meetup. I'm afraid I don't have a URL for it. But um, thanks very much for coming along, folks, and um, uh, have a great day.